Well, good morning to all of you, and uh, great pleasure to be here. I haven't been in Wellington for a few years, so it's good to be back and uh, provided me an opportunity to catch up with some old friends. Anyway, this morning's uh, discussion is about what uh, governments can do uh, to prepare for the future. And let me first uh, begin with uh, something that happened several years ago, February 2003. Uh, a virus at that time which had no name, turned out to be the SARS virus, entered Singapore and they came through three women who had returned from Hong Kong with symptoms of atypical pneumonia. And this virus spread with frightening speed through the hospital system. It confounded our medical authorities. In the beginning, they did not know how the virus spread and why it spread so aggressively. And the fatality rate was shocking. By the time the SARS crisis was declared over in Singapore, 33 people had died out of the 238 who had been infected. Now, SARS was a black swan for Singapore. And what is a black swan? Uh, Nicholas Talib described a black swan as a hard to predict event with a large impact. And indeed, it was a frightening time for Singapore. Overnight, the visitors plunged almost to zero. The tourism industry was decimated. SARS severely affected the Singapore economy, leading to a contraction and a quarter-long recession that year. Now, there are many lessons to be learned for Singapore from the SARS crisis of 2003, but I would like to highlight one in order to set the context for my remarks this morning. It is that other black swans will surprise us, and us is not just Singapore, us is all of us, time and again, as much, if not more, than we were by SARS. In recent years, the world seems to have been beset by a succession of strategic shocks, such as 911, the financial economic turbulence of 2008, 2009, 2011 Japanese tsunami, the nuclear meltdowns, the Eurozone crisis. And I would imagine that the Christchurch earthquake of February 2011 was a black swan for New Zealand. Furthermore, the frequency of such shocks seems to be increasing and the amplitude of their impact appears to be growing. The question is, why? Now, from the middle of the 20th century, a period that is sometimes described as the Great Acceleration, change has accelerated at a pace and on a global scale that is unprecedented in history. Now, these just show, you know, what's happening uh, from about the 1950s onwards. Everything's uh, picking up pace. Rapid urbanization, population growth surge, huge, enormous consumer demand. And the effort to meet this demand through industrialization, mass production, has had a huge but unpredictable impact on the world's ecosystem. Globalization resulting from and combined with technological innovation has in turn accelerated change on all fronts, political, economic, and social. And much of this change has followed unpredictable trajectories. And the reason for this is complexity. Now, complex is not the same as complicated. It is something very different. The natural world is complex, an engineering system is merely complicated. It could be a machine or an aeroplane or telecommunication satellite. Its inner workings may be hard for a layman to understand, but it is designed to perform certain predetermined functions that are repeatable. It embodies the Newtonian characteristics of predictable cause and effect. But in contrast, a complex system will not necessarily behave in a repeatable and predetermined manner. Now, cities are complex systems, as are human societies. The Earth's ecology is also a complex system. Political systems are complex. Countries are complex. The world as a whole is a complex and unordered system. In all likelihood, 
a complicated world has not existed for a very long time, if it ever did. Now, the Great Acceleration has seen huge leaps forward in technology, in telecommunications, the internet, transportation, leading to vastly increased trade and the movement of people around the world. But the connections and feedback loops resulting from the Great Acceleration have greatly increased complexity at the global level. The ancient Chinese philosopher Lao Tzu instinctively grasped the complex nature of the world that we live in when he wrote that everything is connected and everything relates to each other. Now, connections and interactions within a complex system are extremely difficult to detect. They are inexplicable and they are emergent. Efforts to model complex systems, such as the Club of Rome's famous model of economic and population growth, have actually not proven to be very useful. Unlike in a complicated system, the components of a complex system interact in ways that defy a deterministic linear analysis. And as a result, we are constantly surprised and shocked by black swans and other unknown unknowns. This is a term used by Donald Rumsfeld. Unfortunately, complexity not only generates black swans, but also gives rise to what political scientist Horst Rittel called wicked problems. Now, wicked problems have no immediate or obvious solutions. They are large and intractable issues. They have causes and influencing factors that are not easily determined ex ante. They are highly complex problems because they contain many agents interacting with each other in often mystifying ways. They have many stakeholders who not only have different perspectives on the wicked problem, but who also do not necessarily share the same goals. Tackling one part of a wicked problem is more likely than not going to create and lead to new issues in other parts. Satisfying one stakeholder could well make the rest unhappy. A key challenge for governments is to move the many stakeholders towards a broad alignment of perspectives and goals. But this requires patience and a lot of skill at stakeholder engagement and consensus building. Now, these are examples of wicked problems. Climate change is an example of a wicked problem at a global level. Pandemics are another. So are aging populations in the developed world. Sustainable economic development, which is not unconnected to the triangular problem of food, water, and energy security is an enormous wicked problem. In our increasingly interconnected and globalized world, such wicked problems do not manifest in isolation or in a singular fashion. Their impact can and will be felt around the world in many forms and in many fields like politics, economics, and in the social and many other dimensions. Now, in complexity theory, and I'm trying to keep this as simple as possible, there's a concept called retrospective coherence. And let me explain this. The current state of affairs always makes sense when we look backwards. The current pattern is logical. But this is more than saying that there is wisdom in hindsight. It is only, the current pattern is only one of many patterns that could have been formed, any one of which would have been equally logical simply because we can provide an explanation for why the current state of affairs has arisen does not mean we are operating in a complex, complicated and knowable world. So while we are what we are today as a result of many decisions taken along the way, retrospective coherence says that in a complex system, even if we were to start again and make the same decisions, there is no certainty that we would end up in the same situation. This is another way of saying that applying the lessons of history is not enough to guide us down the right path for the future. Governments that do not understand retrospective coherence will often assume 
that the operating environment is merely complicated and not complex, one in which cause and effect are linked such that the output can be determined from the input in which one step leads predictably to the next. This is, of course, a dangerous assumption if the operating environment is complex. When governments ignore the complexity of their operating environment, they are at a risk of assuming that the policies that succeeded in the past will continue to work well in the future. They will deal with wicked problems as if they are amenable to simple and deterministic policy prescriptions. And the temptation to take this approach is understandable. It is easier, it requires less resource, and may actually lead to positive outcomes, but only in the short term. However, government policies that do not take complexity into account can, and often do lead to, unintended consequences, with the real danger of national failure in the long run. Unfortunately, the evidence suggests that many governments will opt to take this path either out of political expediency or because of cognitive failures or simply because they lack an understanding and the tools to deal with complexity. Those governments that learn to manage complexity and how to govern in a complex operating environment will gain a competitive advantage over those that do not. But to manage complexity requires fundamental changes to the mindset, capabilities, and organization of government. Uh, in his book, Making Things Work, Solving Complex Problems in a Complex World, Yanir Bayam writes, and I quote, the most basic issues for organizational success is correctly matching, matching the system's complexity to its environment. This is another way of saying that the complexity of the government developing the policy should match the complexity of the system that will be affected by the policy. Now let me illustrate by a Singapore example. On 7 December 2001, this is our equivalent of 911 Black Swan, the authorities announced the detention of several Singaporeans who were members of a previously unknown network of extremists, the Pan-Southeast Asian Jamaya Islamaya, or JI. The JI had been plotting acts of mass terror against several targets in Singapore. Singaporeans, in other words, were prepared to kill fellow Singaporeans in pursuit of demented ideological goals. Now, this was a black swan for Singapore that literally overnight produced a wicked problem for the government, which was how to deal with a threat posed by extremists who were, first, a part of a larger Southeast Asian network, and second, who lived and worked within the community like other ordinary Singaporeans. Now, someone told me in those uncertain days that you needed a network to fight a network. And it was a profound observation that implicitly acknowledged that the JI, as a sprawling, multi-layered network, was a complex organization. <coughs> Our response, both in terms of organization as well as policy, had to match the JI's complexity. It was not going to be possible to destroy the JI network just by hunting down the leadership and decapitating it. To do so would be to deny the JI's essentially complex nature. <coughs> so Singapore took a whole of government, perhaps even a whole of nation approach to the threat posed by the JI. The traditional approach of delineating the boundaries between agencies so that each would be possible for a particular area would not work. Thank you. No government agency had the full range of competencies or capabilities to deal completely with this complex threat. Now, rather than go the American way of creating our own Department of Homeland Security, we decided that a better way would be to strengthen coordination and integration among the government agencies. We leveraged on the diverse strengths of the existing agencies, 
This meant coordinating the counterterrorism efforts of the line agencies and the ministries at the operational level, while integrating strategy and policy at the whole of government level. This approach meant we would only have a small but active centre, the National Security Coordination Secretariat, with the capacity to drive the strategic national agenda in counterterrorism, but which would not interfere with the accountabilities of each agency. So many agencies were roped in and at different levels, from the security, economic, and social sectors. Even community groups and leaders were activated to help manage potential frictions and communal sensitivities. Now, in the beginning, this was a real challenge. The non-security agencies felt that this was a matter to be dealt with by the security agencies, and the security agencies in turn felt that their turf was being trampled upon. You know, but now looking back, this whole of government approach had a compelling logic, a complex and multi-layered network of government agencies and non-governmental organizations had been created. The policies that were Im implemented were complex. They were both defensive and offensive, employing both hard power and soft power. We had established a complex system to deal with a complex situation. And it is an approach that the Singapore government has since applied to other wicked problems like population, in our case, and climate change. Governments will need to know how they should be organized to deal with black swans, unknown unknowns, and the wicked problems that complexity generates. Creating new departments to deal with new wicked problems can be wasteful and ultimately ineffective if these creations contain, do not contain enough organizational complexity. Developing policies and plans to deal with such wicked problems requires the integration of diverse insights, experience, and expertise. People from different organizations, both from within and outside government, have to come together, pool their knowledge in order to discover potential solutions. Cooperative mechanisms need to be set up to enable the sharing of information and to strengthen collective action. The whole of government approach injects diversity and complexity into the policy process. It recognizes that in complex situations and when dealing with wicked problems, insights and good ideas are not the monopoly of single agencies or of government acting alone. It strikes a balance between strength and stability of the formal vertical government structure and the diversity from different perspectives and solutions derived from a larger and more varied horizontal network of government and even national resource that means the private and the people sectors. While the whole of government approach may be an imperative, it is not easily achieved. Governments, like any large hierarchical organization, tend to optimize at the departmental level rather than the whole of government level. That's human nature. In a hierarchy, the leader at the top receives all the information and he makes the decisions. But under stress, Hierarchies can be unresponsive, even dangerously dysfunctional, because there are, in reality, decision-making bottlenecks at the top. Complexity stresses hierarchies. The world that governments operate in today is too complex and too fast-changing for the people at the top to have the full expertise and all the answers to call all the shots. Therefore, vertical silos need to be broken down so that information can flow horizontally to reach other departments. It is not need to know, but knowing enough so that each component of the larger organization can respond to issues and challenges as they arise. An environment that encourages the spontaneous horizontal flow of information will enlarge and enrich the worldview of all departments, and this in turn improves the chances that connections hidden by complexity, as well as emergent challenges and opportunities, are discovered early in good time. Now, the German military 
adopted with great success, at least at operational level. I'm not talking about the strategic level. And this is a concept of military command called off frax tactic. It was a philosophy of command that acknowledged the complexity and chaos of war. In off frax tactic, even the most junior officers were empowered to make decisions on the spot because it was felt they had a better and more direct feel for the situation on the ground. It meant that down the line, every officer had to understand not just the orders, but also the intent of the larger mission. In turn, he was empowered to make decisions to adjust to the situation as he judged it in order to better fulfill the intent of the mission. Whole of government implicitly contains the central idea of off tactic, which is that in complexity, it is not possible for everything to be centrally directed. Not unlike off tactic, whole of government depends critically on people at all levels understanding how their roles fit in with the larger national aims and objectives. Agencies must have a strong sense and a shared understanding of the challenges that the nation faces and the underlying principles to guide responses. Then it depends on the good sense of each agency to ensure that its own plans and policies are aligned with the national imperatives, to ensure that its own plans and policies are aligned with the national imperatives to the point that they instinctively react to the threats and opportunities as they arise, knowing that what they do will advance the larger national rather than departmental interests. But whole of government is a holy grail. In countries like Singapore, it remains very much work in progress. It requires emphasis, support, and constant attention from the top, or in other words, nagging. You need to nag the people. Now, there's another challenge to governments in complex situations, and this was evident in the April 2010 eruption of the Icelandic volcano with the unpronounceable name. <laughs> I, I really can't pronounce it. <laughs> when a huge cloud of volcanic dust started to spread over Europe, air traffic authorities grounded thousands of aircraft as a safety precaution. Europe was almost paralyzed. It caused travel chaos around the world and disrupted global supply chain for weeks. Now, we know that volcanoes erupt from time to time. We also know that it is risky to fly through volcanic ash clouds. Yet why, despite this knowledge, was the world so surprised and unprepared for the impact of this particular eruption? Now, first, although the risk of eruption is known, it is actually very difficult to assess its probability of occurrence. Behavioral economics, economists point out that we underrate the probability of event when it has not happened recently and overrate the probability of an event when it has. And as a result of this cognitive bias, the risk of an eruption was underrated in this case as the Icelandic volcano had been quiescent for a long time. Second, the effect of the eruption on aircraft flights was the result of complex interconnectivities and therefore highly unpredictable. When the Icelandic volcano erupted, aviation authorities depended on predictions of analytical models and reacted with caution by shutting down all flights. But the commercial impact was enormous and the industry under pressure began to question the reliability of these models that the governments relied on. And they proposed doing experimental flights to probe whether indeed it was safe or not to fly through the ash cloud. And in this event, the experimental flights proved to be a better indicator for action than reliance on the model. This is a clear demonstration of the value of exploration and experimentation when we are confronted with complex phenomena instead of only relying 
on the predictions of analytical models. Cognitive bias and the extreme difficulty of estimating the cumulative effects of complex events make preparing for unseen situations an exercise fraught in difficulty. It also adds to the challenges of governments operating in complex situations. Now, in such a complex operating environment, governments should be adaptive. They must be able to navigate through situations characterized by emergence, multi-causality and ambiguity, as they were during the eruption of the Icelandic volcano. Governments often have to make big decisions and develop plans and policies under conditions of incomplete information and uncertain outcomes. It is not possible to prepare exhaustively for every contingency. Instead, a search and discover approach should be adopted. The deployment of experimental flights to check out the real risk of flying through a cloud of volcanic ash exemplifies this approach. The military calls this approach the UDA loop, observe, orientate, decide, act, which is a recurring cycle of decision making that acknowledges and also takes advantage of the uncertainty and complexity of the battlefield. And governments are in a constant battle, so they, they need to think like military planners. Now, scenario, scenario planning is a linear method of carrying out the UDA loop in the sense that it projects futures based on our understanding of our operating environment today. And used intelligently, it can be a very important tool for planning and can help to overcome cognitive biases by challenging our mental models. But it is insufficient in a complex, unordered environment. In this regard, nonlinear methods should be part of the government's complexity toolbox. And they include techniques like backcasting, policy gaming, which is akin to military war gaming, but applied to the civilian policy context. And policy gaming aims to condition policy makers to complex and uncertain situations and to help them confront their own cognitive biases. Another one, horizon scanning. RAS is, a, in Singapore, a, a, a computer-based suite of tools, but it is a process for detecting emerging trends, threats, and opportunities. Now, governments must also be able to manage the risk that is a natural result of operating in complexity. There will always be threats to national outcomes, policies, and plans, because no amount of analysis and forward planning will eliminate the volatility and uncertainty that exists in a complex world. And these threats constitute strategic risk. But there's little by way of best practice to systematically address or ameliorate the threats to national goals that these strategic risks pose. In Singapore, the government is developing a whole of government integrated risk management framework. We call it WAGAM. Terrible name. But this is a government chain that begins with risk identification and assessment at the strategic level to monitoring of risk indicators, and finally, to resource mobilization and behavioral changes to prepare for each anticipated risk. WAGAM also plays an imperfect but important role in helping to discover the interconnections among risk factors, and this in turn helps to reduce some of the complexity. The WAGAM framework is work in progress, and we have started using it for strategic conversations on risks that occur at the whole of government level. Now, WAGAM is also critical to building resilience, which is the ability to cope with strategic shock by adapting to or even transforming with rapid and turbulent change. And resilience ought to be a key characteristic of governments that operate effectively in a complex environment. Now, resilient governments must go beyond an, an emphasis on efficiency. Lean systems that focus exclusively on efficiency are unlikely to have sufficient resources to deal with unexpected shocks and volatility, while also having the bandwidth to make plans for an uncertain future filled with wicked problems. Now, this is not an argument for establishing bloated and sluggish bureaucracies. 
But one important idea is for resident governments to have a small but dedicated group of people to think about the future. The skill sets needed are different from those required to sh deal with short-term volatility and crisis. Both are important, but those charged with thinking about the future systematically should be allocated the bandwidth to focus on the long term without getting bogged down with day-to-day -day routine. They will become repository of patterns that can be used to facilitate decision-making, to prepare for unknown unknowns, and perhaps to conduct policy experiments through policy gaming or other simulations. Now, to this end, the Singapore government set up the Centre for Strategic Futures a couple of years ago. It is a think tank that promotes a whole-of-government approach to strategic planning and decision-making. It works on leading-edge concepts like Wagam and resilience. It promotes fresh approaches to dealing with complexity, like policy gaming. It encourages experiments with new computer-based tools and sense-making methods to improve horizon scanning. And although a small outfit, the CSF is a catalyst for strategic change in the government and its agencies. Now, the future promises ever more complexity, carrying in its train more black swans and unknown unknowns. Governments must learn how to operate and even thrive within this complexity and to deal confidently with strategic shocks when they occur. The first step is to acknowledge the inherent complexity of the operating environment. Then they should consider the imperative of the whole of government approach and the adoption of new nonlinear tools for managing complexity and strategic risk. These will not eliminate shocks, but by improving the ability to anticipate such shocks, governments might actually reduce their frequency and impact. And in turn, this will make governments and nations more resilient as their leaders govern for the future. Thank you. Thank, thank you for an absolutely fascinating presentation. Uh, looking at the civil service as being a professional group of people that are there for a quite a long time, one can understand that they would be able to uh, handle this kind of analysis. But on top of that, within our system, you have a set of amateur ministers without management training who, who as a collective group, are complex. They're a complex system in themselves. So that the actual decision-making group uh, to which this expert group reports uh, is a complex system. And how does one handle uh, that difficulty? Well, the starting point uh, in, for my response to that is we have to assume that each group, including the political decision makers, have their own cognitive biases. Uh, the leaders at the top, whether they are amateurs or professionals, will have a certain set of beliefs. Sometimes their time horizons may be fairly short. And if they are confronted with some unpleasant news that the professional civil servants who have been thinking about these problems uh, offer to them, their first reaction will be to reject it, not uh, for any reason other than the human response to something that they don't like to hear. It's a cognitive bias, it's natural. So it's very important, I think, when we deal with uh, these kind of complex issues, to find ways to walk around these cognitive biases. In fact, I, I would say one of the biggest problems for us is when we ignore these cognitive biases. And I mentioned policy gaming only because I think it is one very important way to walk around these cognitive uh, biases. That means put the decision makers into the policy game, put them in a safe place where they can confront issues outside their comfort zone and ask themselves, now how would I react to this without having to make any initial commitment? So I'm not saying that there's an easy answer to that, but I think the bigger failure will be to ignore these kinds of problems and then assume that just logic and uh, compelling staff paper is enough to persuade the decision maker to uh, make a good, solid decision. And then we are then going to be bitterly disappointed when, the, when, when it's rejected. So I think we have to recognize this reality. It's a human nature. I think 
I assume that most politicians are mostly well-meaning uh, people, but we have to find ways to walk around it. So engaging them is a very important part of this process of getting around their cognitive biases. Engage them by, through policy gaming is possible. If you look at the US, they're quite famous for putting their presidents and all that into these war game situations. It helps them think about the unthinkable. They're not being forced to make real decisions, but it starts a train of thinking about what the issues really are. When we do scenario planning in Singapore, we also talk to the politicians and say, okay, what is, what is it that keeps you awake at night? Maybe all of them sleep very well, but some of them maybe uh, get insomnia, they have nightmares every time they go to sleep, but I, I think there, there are ways to get around this thing, but no simple method. You have to have many approaches so that the political leadership is conditioned to start thinking about the unthinkable and unpleasant and uncomfortable issues which they don't normally think about. Mark. Thanks, Peter. That was a terrific presentation. I agree with Jim. Two quick questions. The first is, it seems to me increasingly, and you mentioned this in your presentation, that whole of government is no longer the issue in itself. It's whole of not government. In other words, how well government engages many, many complex voices and resources outside. So the quest first question is, how comfortable do you think the civil service is in your own experience with that kind of uh, engagement, because that's a challenge. The second quick question I'd have is that consistently in this conversation, we hear very little about what we're doing to change the underlying accountability, control and power structures, which are implied by everything you've just said. We don't seem to spend so much time doing that, and maybe in that um, lack of alignment, there's quite a deal of challenge for folks inside the system to make many of the things that you've talked about really yeah. work. Well, I think the, 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 the first question, uh, the answer to the first question will probably lead uh, some way towards an answer to the second question. Uh, in Singapore, uh, we have had most experience in terms of engaging uh, the larger community outside government in the economic sphere. So uh, since I think the first very serious recession in Singapore in 1985, We've uh, set up a series of uh, four uh, economic committees. The latest has been called the Economic Strategies Committee, but these are not just uh, many government agencies coming together, but many government agencies together with uh, members of the private sector, business groups and all that sitting together and debating in a very fundamental way what the, what the issues are whether there are any sacred cows which should be slaughtered. And we've been through this four times. So the government is pretty comfortable and, uh, with doing this. And you know now when, when you have a new policy, you're required to have a public consultation. Sometimes you do this face-to-face, -face, a town hall type of approach. Sometimes it's just on the internet, you can give your, your input. So, so they, they, they're quite comfortable with doing this on the, on the economic side. Where we are less comfortable and we are now beginning to uh, confront this challenge is how to deal with this on social policy. That's more challenging because then you're not just talking about the private sector, you're talking about the people sector and everybody in the people sector has an opinion. Now, how do you engage them? And that, again, there are no uh, straightforward answers, but we are increasingly looking at what, what we call co-creation. That means uh, ideas surface from the bottom up, either from the government, from the people, and those more promising ones, we try to develop them together. So it is, uh, I, I use the term, it's no longer government to you, but it's government with you. That means government learning to work together with the other sectors. And I think this is very much a work in progress. The political climate in Singapore as around the world is changing. Social media facilitates this uh, in both a positive and negative way, but it's a reality that all governments have to grapple with, and all governments are still discovering how best to use this. But I think the mode of government is changing. And in fact, we may be seeing a compression from uh, government by departments to whole of government to whole of nation. And I think the trick now is 
to move from very quickly to whole of government, and in parallel with this, move from whole of government to whole of nation. And I think this is an imperative going forward. There was a fascinating question from Martin about whole of not, you know, whole of not government, and there's some thinking about. It. Uh, we're going to have to draw it to a close because we've got another keynote speaker coming straight on. I think Jim Carlton over here was uh, an Anzog former board member was spot on when he said that was a fascinating diagnosis of the challenges that confront government, and it's neatly linked the themes we were looking at yesterday to what we'll be looking at today in terms of the analytical themes. I'd like to thank Peter again for his wonderful overview and messages for government institutions. <laughs> <laughs>